our topic today is not just simply about COVID-19, but what the heck happened? We're going to talk about Twitter files, censorship, and a story that, quite frankly, you'll never believe. A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. Well, I'm very excited to have today with us two preeminent scientists in the world, quite frankly, in public health. Dr. Jay Bhattacharya is a professor at Stanford University Medical School. He's a physician, epidemiologist. He's also a health economist and also a public health policy expert focusing on infectious diseases and vulnerable populations. And then we have Dr. Martin Koldorf. He's a professor of medicine at Harvard. He's a biostatistician and epidemiologist with expertise in detecting and monitoring infectious disease outbreaks and vaccine safety evaluations. And if that was not enough, he's also a senior fellow at the Brownstone Institute. And quite frankly, they're also not only smart, but they're also my friends. So I'm delighted to welcome them here today. Thank you, David. So good to be here. I'm very excited about this conversation today. Our last conversation together on Leaders on the Frontier it's hard to believe, was back in September 2022, and that's some six months ago, and everything has changed. And uh, I don't think that's an overstatement, Um, but it it, it, just at a a glance, would you say that we've learned a lot looking back the last six months alone? I mean, I think the last six months have made clear a number of things. Uh, First, the collateral harms from lockdown have become more and more evident to the point where they're just undeniable. Uh, in particular, the harms to children have become abundantly clear uh, with, with study after study showing deep learning losses, especially in poor children. The evidence from the from the poorer parts of the world show uh, poverty increases in poverty, increases in 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 uh, in, in malnutrition and, and even frank starvation that that we haven't seen in a generation. Um, we, and we're starting to see uh, the health effects of the lockdowns even in in richer countries as uh, as as the you know the, the cumulative effect of delaying basic preventative medical care are, are taking its toll. What about you, uh, uh, Dr. Kaldorf? What what would you say in terms of some of the things that you've observed that have changed? Well, if we look at excess mortality, uh, most Western countries have now excess mortality that's not due to COVID, but due to other things such as the lockdowns, uh, uh, cancer screening that didn't happen, uh, and so on. Uh, diabetes care that's not wasn't as good, uh, lack the uh, cardiovascular disease, mental health problems, and if we compare the Western countries, the the one country that does not have this excess mortality, the lowest excess mortality from 20, 2020 to 22 is Sweden, which did not lock down in the same way as other countries did. Wow. So I think a lot of people listening would be kind of shocked by that. So I just want to make sure we understand that. So you're saying that the mortality of COVID-19 wasn't so much the issue. It was the response to it. Is that right, Martin? Yes, correct. Uh, The lockdowns did not help uh, with COVID-19. It might have postponed the problems a little bit. But Sweden has one of the lowest COVID mortalities, not the very lowest, but one of the lowest. But when it comes to excess mortality, where you look both at mortality from COVID and mortality from lockdowns and other other, uh, uh, pandemic measures, Sweden is, is the lowest. So if so, you would say, Martin, that if the, the facts are looking back now over the past three plus years, that Sweden did it right. Is that the conclusion? Sweden got it right and most other places got it wrong. Wow. And so what I find fascinating about this is we talk about the Great Barrington Declaration, and that, that was the place where you came up with a statement. You, uh, Martin and Jay, and also uh, Dr. Sunita um, uh, Gupta from Oxford University came up with this incredible statement uh, some years ago, October 2020, as I recall, 
that basically said what? What can you can you refresh your memories about what that statement said and why did you write it, uh, Jay? Well, the Great Barrington Declaration uh, was premised on two basic scientific facts that were clear from the, almost the earliest days of the pandemic. One is the very, very steep gradient in risk of mortality from infection. It's really older people that this disease is deadly for. I think it's still the case that something like 70, 80 percent of the people that have died from COVID infection over the age of 70 or 65. Uh, and th that's so. And whereas for children, the risk was very, 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 very low relative to other risks in their lives. The second scientific fact, again, unde undeniable and, and well known, in, even in October 2020, is that lockdowns are tremendously harmful, especially to the poor, especially to the vulnerable, especially to to children. Uh, we knew that for a fact. We knew that from decades of social science work, from medical work, that uh, social isolation. Uh, closing schools would have tremendous negative consequences on the health and well-being of of the, the poor, vulnerable, and and, uh, and and working class populations. If you combine those two ideas, that you get the Great Barrington Declaration: focus protection of vulnerable older people because the disease is quite deadly for them. Um, meaning n not like forced isolation in quarantine camps or something crazy, but rather uh, resources and, and, and an orientation of public health to provide support so that uh, even vulnerable older people could find ways to isolate uh, themselves during times of high disease spread. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with, with, uh, where, 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 whereas um, for younger people, especially for children, lifting lockdowns. Uh, the, the Great Branch Declaration corresponded to our standard pandemic management plan that we've followed for a century of respiratory virus pandemics successfully. It's really the lockdowns that were a tremendous departure from our traditional practice. So in that sense, the Great Branch Declaration was just a restatement of the old ideas of how, should, how to do pandemic management that had worked for a century. Exactly. So, Martin, when you reflect on the Great Barrington Declaration, do you feel frankly vindicated? I mean, you recommended um, all three of you as well as almost the million people, leaders in healthcare that signed it, essentially best practices. This is the plan that that um, we follow. Do you, so do you feel vindicated now? Yeah, what a surprise. Uh, 100 years of public health wisdom turned out to be correct. <laughs> yes. Um, there's actually one example from Canada. Uh, the, the Haldeman Norfolk Health Districts in Ontario implemented focus protection because of the health office there, Matt Strauss. And we now know what the result was. They had 30% less COVID deaths than uh, the rest of Ontario. Okay, so can you please yeah, repeat that, Martin? So you're saying in a region in Southern Ontario called Haldem and Norfolk, the, the county, um, they did it differently as well. That's fascinating. Yeah, so they implemented focus protection uh, uh, and uh, they did better on, on COVID mortality. But of course, the major benefit is also they didn't get all the collateral public health damage. Okay, but as I recall, Martin, that um, that uh, medical officer of health for that region, uh, I believe his name is Dr. Strauss, was was thoroughly criticized and, um, quite frankly, um, uh, you know, attacked personally on on so many accounts for not going along with the way so many others did it. Is that correct? He took a lot of heat, and he stood strong. And by doing that, he saved many people's lives. So he is so, uh, one of the heroes uh, of this uh, pandemic, one of the few. Okay, so for Jay and, and Martin, I know this sounds rather harsh, so I, I do want to qualify my question. But it seems like you wrote the, the Great Barrington Declaration to state in many ways the obvious, that we needed to follow um, best practices of healthcare that are frankly wisdom over a hundred years. And yet uh, so many authorities, not all, um, didn't follow that. And now looking back in retrospect, you were clearly right. It's almost like everything they told us, masks, lockdowns, um, the whole story about natural immunity, even the whole challenge now of understanding how helpful vaccines are, um, you know, the, the, the impacts on, on all of this, they were entirely wrong. Is there anything, am I, am, I, am I being too harsh? Is that incorrect? Is there anything that they were right on? 
You know, I think uh, the it's been disheartening for me uh, personally. I, I spent, you know, and Martin has also spent decades working in public health, working in medicine, um, and the principles on which I decide whether a, what what the scientific what's the correct scientific uh, you know sort of a set of ideas is, is very simple. It's there's, it's it's evidence based medicine. It's critical thinking. It's 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 uh, you know, you, you look and see what's worked. You you aim to to uh, make public health decisions that respect the intelligence and a- autonomy of, of the public. Um, you don't make any decision that makes the lives of the poor, the vulnerable, uh, the working class any harder than it needs than than, than it already is. Um, I think all of those principles, I thought, guided public health, mm-hmm. and it was it's been the shock of my life, David, to see all of those very basic ethical principles thrown out the window during the pandemic. Wow. Um, especially on I mean, evidence-based medicine, on issue after issue, the scientific and public health establishment abandoned evidence-based medicine. On masks, on lockdowns, uh, uh, it, is, it has been absolutely shocking to watch, on school closures, it has been shocking to watch uh, the scientific establishment and the, uh, specific, specifically the public health establishment throw away um, this, this deep wisdom that, that it's have taken you know, a century to gain. So, so Jay, I think a lot of people would be shocked to hear what you're saying. I mean, you're you're a, a, a preeminent leader in in public health in the world, and so you're you're saying that like we heard the refrain time and time again, "Let's follow the science," but we didn't follow the science, did we? So, what's a good example of that? What what's a stunning example that people need to know about? Well, there are like a few principles of public health that we have thrown out the window. One is Public health is not about one disease, it's about all of health. Mm. It's not just about COVID. It's about cancer, cardiovascular, diabetes, mental health, and so on. So you can't just focus on one disease and ignore everything else, and that will deteriorate. And that's exactly what happened during this pandemic. All the focus was on COVID in a futile uh, attempt to get rid of it, which was never going to happen, but then doing so much damage to other aspects of public health. Another thing is that in public health, you have to look uh, view it long term. If you have a hurricane, which we do in the US, what you can do is you can sort of leave your home and hunker down for a few days. And then when the hurricane is over, you come back and you resume your normal life. Infectious disease outbreak doesn't work that way. If you have a pandemic, it's going to come. You can push it forward in time a little bit, but you cannot avoid it. You have to go through it. Exactly. Uh, so. Uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, countries were sort of uh, competing to see who could press down the COVID the most. But then they had it later instead, and they had the mortality later instead. So those are two fundamental principles of public health. Also, of course, public health is about everybody in society. I, I think that's well said, Martin. Um, so in this context, Martin, are you concerned that we've done irreparable harm to many societies, including Canada? Yes. Well, just take the school closings. Children need to go to school. To close the schools has effect uh, effect on these kids for the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. So that will be for decades and decades to come. And they're never going to get back that education that they lost. We know that if you have less education, you do less well in, in life uh, in terms of public health and many other things. So uh, that's not going to be... Uh, that doesn't show up in the mortality statistics because these are kids, they survive, mm-hmm. uh, but it will show up in, uh, in uh, a detriment for the future. Uh, well said. What about you, Jay? How would you respond to that question? I mean, the, the, the harms to Canadians is absolutely uh, irreparable in, in, in so many ways. Uh, Martin already mentioned the, the, all, the all-cause excess deaths in Canada, which is, you know, I think it's like uh, nearly double the, the cumulative all-cause excess deaths through the pandemic for Sweden. Um, uh, the, the other things are are uh, for, for the for the living. Um, the other things are 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 are, are still going to last for quite a long time. I mean, I think a lot of times during the pandemic, people have said, "Well, we have to trade the economy off so that we people can live." But in fact, the economic harm to Canadians is has been tremendous. Um, huge numbers of businesses, especially small businesses, are closed now that otherwise would be. You have inflation, you have uh, high unemployment, 
um, you, you have essentially like a debt overhang. Um, these have health consequences, David. These are not simply just mo money. These money, the money buys the, the capacity for people to live longer, healthier lives. Um, and, and recessions and um, inflation are all bad for the health of the public, especially the poor. Um, uh, the other the other thing I'd say about uh, about the Canadian response, you know, the Canadian response was particularly cruel to the unvaccinated. Uh, it made it, uh, it so so it the the Canadian um, policy for the longest time was that if you were unvaccinated, you couldn't even travel internally within Canada on a plane or a bus. Um, that's that's unique. I mean, that's not not very many countries did that. Um, and as a consequence, a lot of lives were ruined. Even people who had already had COVID and recovered and th thereby were actually at lower risk of spreading the disease to others than someone that was simply vaccinated, never had COVID. They also were subject to the same discrimination. Um, I, I, I'm like, I just try to put myself in the shoes of somebody like that. What, what they must think of public health, what must think of government that embraced discri irrational discrimination against them, destroying their life prospects for the pro for the idea that you could stop the spread of a respiratory disease that, that was very clear from the very beginning that was not going to be possible to stop. Exactly. I, I think, Jay, you make a, an excellent point is that part of the irreparable harm is not only cascading through the economy and its impact on people's livelihood and, and indeed their health, but is ironically on the trust that we would have in public health officials now. Um, I, I hear this from a lot of people. Um, is heaven forbid that we would have a real pandemic and how we would then respond to instruction from public health officials. It's, it's really ironic, isn't it, Jay? It, it absolutely is. The, the collapse in trust in public health is nothing like I've ever seen in my professional career. And I honestly don't know how to get it back. I think a, a good first step would be an, a, an admission of, of catastrophic error on the part of current public health authorities. That, that, that they made mistakes. Uh, I, and frankly, I would ask that they would apologize to the people that they that they harmed, that discriminated against. So many people fired um, because they didn't take a vaccine that they weren't convinced would be good for them. Well, why weren't they convinced? Because public health basically denied the basic principles of of, uh, of, of evidence-based medicine, denied immunity after, that there was immunity after COVID recovery, um, d d overemphasized beyond what the evidence showed regarding the, the efficacy of the vaccine to stop transmission, uh, underplayed the, the possibility of vaccine harm. A lot of people were, were uh, have looked at how public health has behaved, the pronouncements they've made, they compared it against the reality they see, and they're very different. And so it's no surprise they've lost trust. But it's bad for for the public for the public uh, for public health to not be worthy of trust. Public health is very important for the health of the public, I think, David. Um, and so I, I think uh, it, it behooves public health authorities to work to re restore that trust, and and that's going to require self reflection, uh, and frankly, apologies from the leaders of public health. Exactly, um, Martin. I did want to turn to you because you're a, a biostatistician. And um, you're very familiar with um, vaccine development. It seemed like during this whole last three years, the authorities have really weighed in heavily that the answer to um, this virus was really all about vaccines. W was that correct? Uh, vaccines was one of uh, was one important uh, measure against the against the pandemic. Uh, but public health got it completely wrong. Uh, the thing is that yes, to say that, so that everybody should get vaccinated is just as scientifically flawed as saying that nobody should get vaccinated. So for older people in their 70s and 80s, they were very, very high risk uh, of uh, mortality from COVID, from dying. And uh, the vaccine saved uh, many lives among this age group. But that doesn't mean that if you've had COVID already, you already have better immunity than if you're vaccinated. So you don't need to have the vaccine. Uh, but, and if you're young, if you're a child or young adult, you have also minuscule risk of COVID mortality. Uh, so you don't need a vaccine. Uh, so if you're old, even if there's an adverse reaction, a small risk of an adverse reaction to the vaccine is still worth it because the protection, because you have quite a high risk of dying from disease from COVID. 
But if you are a low risk from COVID, even a small risk from the vaccine will put the sort of benefit risk in the negative. It's, it's not worth taking. So uh, the public health establishment sort of completely got it wrong by saying that everybody needs to get this vaccine. And it actually killed people because uh, in the beginning of 2020, there was a shortage of these vaccines. And you could see uh, people on uh, Facebook and Twitter who were bragging about, like they were 30 years old, bragging about how they got the vaccine and how uh, virtuous they was for getting the vaccine. Even though that vaccine should have been used instead uh, for my uh, 85-year-old neighbor who uh, didn't get the vaccine at the time. So uh, uh, old people died because the, they didn't prioritize get, getting the vaccine to the old people. And instead, there was young people who was virtually signaling about getting the vaccine. Or they were forced to, if they were at the university, uh, there was a vaccine mandate. They were forced to get it, while those in the 80s were not forced to get it. So a lot of young people got it who didn't need it, while a lot of older people who would have benefited from it didn't get it. So that makes a lot of sense, Martin. It, 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 it's just that vaccines can be helpful, but target them to the most vulnerable, namely older persons with um, multiple health challenges. I, I think what's also fascinating um, uh, to both of you, this is a question, is it relates to therapeutics. It's like the virus came along and the only answer was putting someone isol in isolation, even on a a respirator. I remember when there was this huge push to manufacture respirators, and then there was no, uh, almost a, a, uh, an incredible uh, prosecution of people who, like as physicians, that would be rec recommending other treatment alternatives. And this seemed bizarre to me because surely as a physician, you want to relate to your patient and, and they want to customize a, a particular solution to a health challenge. But it's like the government intervened in that kind of relationship. Is that a fair assessment, Jay? I, I think it's completely fair, David. I think um, like you know, take respirators. Uh, it's not a surprise that, 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 uh, that, that we had in some extent such high mortality early in the pandemic. We overused respirators, we used respiratory respirator protocols that were not standard um, and uh, very quickly, the World Health Organization recommended changing those respiratory protocols and the, Sorry, the mortality well, hold rate. Hold on, What do you mean by we use protocols or use of respirators that was not standard? What, what does that uh, mean? Like in particular, we used criteria for deciding whether patients should be on a respirator that would would normally not be used, right? So just just a, a low pulse oxygen does not automatically mean you should be on a on a ventilator. Um, you 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 use other you know other clinical criteria. Um, the way we manage patients with COVID now, and in, frankly, even in just summer of 2020, is vastly different than the way we manage them in March of 2020. Um, now that's that you can ex I mean, some extent you can excuse. It's a new disease, and people are don't really know what the right thing to do is. I can understand that's complete to me at least mm -hmm. understandable, right? Yeah. Um, What's less understandable is that there was, it seemed like almost a lack of interest in doing a rigorous evaluation of promising early treatments. Um, from, you know, from the very earliest days of the pandemic, people, there were doctors that were with lots of experience in, mm -hmm. um, uh, who were putting forward hypotheses about how ch relatively cheap drugs might be used hydroxychloroquine, which I actually now ex exposed think that probably didn't work. Um, but there were other more promising ones uh, like fluvoxamine. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, there were cheap ones that did end up be quite prominent, like dex dexamethasone for managing patients in a hospital setting. Um, that in the UK there was a rapid randomized trial. The US NIAID, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, uh, has as its job to evaluate this evidence. Um, and they were very, very slow to do it. Uh, the randomized trial, for instance, for ivermectin uh, for in the U.S. called Active-6 didn't actually complete until 20, what, 2023. Mm -hmm. um, what needed to happen, and this is, is a rapid evaluation of, ran, uh, of high quality randomized evidence of all of these inexpensive drugs conducted by organizations like the NIAID who have a job, that's their primary job. 
The scandal is not whether a particular drug worked or didn't work. We don't, we didn't know until the evidence starts to come in, right? The, only, the scandal is that our public health agencies, our scientific agencies, did not support rapid evaluation of these relatively inexpensive drugs, where, um, where, whereas, of course, it did support the rapid evaluation of, of the vaccine. It should have been an all-hands-on-deck kind of approach. Exactly. Uh, rather than the... Mm-hmm. That sort of push your all, all all your eggs in one basket kind of approach in 2020. It's 2020 that is the scandal. So this you use the word scandal, and I think that's quite appropriate because it the situation begs serious questions. Why those authorities would not look at, as you say, all hands on deck, looking at all options? I mean, this is insane. Of course, any rational person would look at an op a set of options, wouldn't they? Uh, and 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 we didn't do it. So here we are today. We've learned a lot, and we continue to learn a lot of in- new information about what happened. And um, right now, um, I, don't, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the last few weeks, um, a group of citizens called the National Citizens Inquiry has started their work moving uh, from coast to coast as they have hearings in many different cities. And they're hearing from citizens, experts, and I, I believe, um, uh, Jay, you'll be participating in one of those panels but what I find interesting is it's important to learn lessons from this, uh, the management of COVID-19, so this does not happen again because it's, it's negative impacts on people. So you have, both of you, have been part of another group of eminent scientists called the Norfolk Group, uh, named after where you met, um, basically laying out a series of questions that need to be answered. So can you tell us more about those questions that we should be asking now as we look back and forward to the future. Um, Martin, did you want to talk about that? Yeah, so it's an 80-page document where we ask a whole uh, long list of questions and uh, it's available both in English and French uh, for for uh, so that everybody in Canada should have access to it. And we have divided it uh, about questions about the thing we talked about, about the the therapeutics, about school closures, about other lockdown measures, about testing, about the face masks and so on. And it's a bunch of questions that needs to be answered to uh, to evaluate how we did during this uh, pandemic. Well, I, I think those are brilliant questions. Uh, you can find that document posted at the Frontier website. And uh, it's very, very uh, insightful, I believe. And, and, and Jay, so if you looked at this strategically, what are you hoping that document will do as we look to um, the, the story of many countries who are on the path of healing and rebuilding? Why, why is that strategically so important? You know, after a, a patient dies in a hospital where, where maybe they shouldn't have died, what happens is very often is something called a morbidity and mortality conference. And the doctors that are managing that patient, they get together and they have an honest, frank discussion about what went wrong. The, the goal isn't to point fingers, but rather to learn lessons so that the next time those things don't go wrong and the future patients don't die. Um, that, that's what I'm hoping. Uh, you know, after, after um, in the U.S., after the, the space shuttle Challenger blew up in 1986, there was a, a commission that uh, uh, with, with a very famous scientist, Richard Feynman, on it. Who, who uh, he was testifying in Congress? He 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 did this like vivid demonstration. I was young then, I, but I'll never forget it. He had the he had a, a cup of cold water, and he took the, an O ring that had been on the space shuttle, uh, dipped it in the in the ice water, and then shattered it. Um, uh, and it was very clear that that that, that it was that sh- that O ring that was likely responsible for the blowing up of, of the space shuttle, and that led to tremendous reforms within NASA. Much more safe, uh, much more, much more safe flights. Um, it, it was, it, and you know, I think we have an obligation after the catastrophic response in public health by public health to the pandemic and failed response. You know, did we did we did we stop COVID? Did we did we harm children? Did we harm the poor? Um, you know, no, yes, yes, right. So, uh, given that that's, that there is this failure, we have an absolute obligation, country after country, to do an honest evaluation of it. And then undertake reforms on the basis of the answers. And, that, and I, don't, I think that evaluation should not be undertaken by the people who uh, made the decisions. 
You need an independent, honest commission to look at this with independent scientists um, who are not in the decision making. I mean, the, this, if you give it in the hands of the people who made the decisions, they, they're prone to give themselves awards. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a very uh, wise insight is that now is an opportunity to frankly assess and reflect on what are the lessons learned. So, Martin, as you reflect on the work of the Norfolk Group and those questions, um, what are you hoping, like, are, are, are there um, works of inquiry? Are there groups underway internationally that you're aware of that are actually doing it right as they reflect on the lessons learned from COVID-19? Not enough. Uh, there have been in some countries, the UK has one that's ongoing. In the US, we have had some congressional inquiries uh, where some of the questions from the Norfolk Group document has been raised. Uh, but we need uh, uh, we need uh, evaluation both at the national level, both in the U.S. and Canada and other places, but also on the state and provincial level, because uh, in the U.S. and Canada, the, the the strategy was a little bit different in different places. So I think uh, Alberta should have his commission, British Columbia should have a commission, Ontario, Quebec, and so on. I would definitely support that. I think that's very wise. I would like to introduce this next clip. This clip is in the House of Representatives where Congresswoman Nancy Mace, and I believe she's from the uh, state of South Carolina, is frankly grilling former Twitter executives about their censorship of very important health information that matters to all of us. Apparently the views of a Stanford doctor are disinformation to you people. I, along with many Americans, have long-term effects from COVID. Not only was I a long hauler, but I have effects from the vaccine. It wasn't the first shot, but it was the second shot that I now developed asthma that has never gone away since I had the second shot. Um, I have tremors in my left hand, and I have the occasional heart pain that no doctor can explain, and I've had a battery of tests. I find it extremely alarming Twitter's unfettered censorship spread into medical fields, and affected millions of Americans by suppressing expert opinions from doctors and censoring those who disagree with the CDC. So my first question this morning of Ms. Gaddy, may I ask of you, where did you go to medical school? I did not go to medical school. I'm sorry? I did not go to medical school. That's what I thought. Why do you think you or anyone else at Twitter had the medical expertise to censor a doctor's expert opinion? Our policies regarding COVID were designed to protect individuals. We were seeing- You guys censored Harvard-educated doctors, Stanford-educated doctors, doctors that are educated in the best places in the world, and you silenced those voices. I have another tweet by someone with a following of a full 18,000 followers. This person put a chart from the CDC on Twitter. It's the CDC's own data, so it's accurate by your standards. And you all labeled this as misleading. You're not a doctor, right, Ms. Gaddy? No, I'm not. Okay. What makes you think you or anyone else at Twitter have the medical expertise to censor actual, accurate CDC data? I'm not familiar with these particular situations. Yeah, I'm sure you're not. But this is what Twitter did. They labeled this as inaccurate. It is the government's own data. It's ridiculous that we're even having to have this conversation today. It's not just about the laptop. This is about medical advice that expert doctors were trying to give Americans because social media companies like Twitter were silencing their voices. Okay, that clip is so powerful at so many levels. First of all, I should just tell you that Congresswoman deserves a, a medal for her approach with those former Twitter executives. And it's, it's almost comical in a dark way that they're talking about two physicians, namely you, Jay, and namely you, Martin. Um, they talked not only about the Stanford uh, physician, uh, Dr. Jay Bettacherry yourself, but also it was funny in the background, I don't know if you noticed this, but there's a, a sheet of, of communications that's going on that is from you, Dr. Martin Kaldorf. So when you see that clip, what do you say? What, what goes through your mind? Well, that clip was from a tweet that was censored where I said that uh, uh, it's important to vaccinate older, high-risk people, but uh, if you have had COVID, you don't need a vaccine, and if you're young, you don't need it. So uh, that's accurate information, and it's pretty astonishing that uh, uh, somebody who knows nothing about public health decides what to censor and what not to censor. Yeah, it's, it's frankly uh, job smacking. 
and whether I mean the government was uh, pushing uh, the social media companies to do censoring on their behalf, but even if that wasn't the case, it's still bad for social media to to uh, to censor because that kills. It kills exactly. people. Exactly. They were Another. actively censoring. What about you, Jay? I mean, I, I completely agree with Martin. Uh, it's it is. Um, I, I mean, I, I, the the West has prided itself forever on um, on the uh, on our va- uh, our fundamental value of, that that we support the free exchange of ideas. Um, this wasn't a, a conversation about this wasn't you know uh, things that probably ought to be left off of social media. It wasn't child porn. It wasn't violent threats. What it was was a legitimate scientific discussion, a legitimate public health discussion by professionals in the field taking place in public on social media. And social media companies, Twitter, Facebook, Google, Reddit, you name it, took took sides. They decided, based on no real argument, just simply raw power, that 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 we we were, we were saying dangerous things, even though what we were saying was rooted in the scientific evidence. Um, you know, uh, the uh, Martin mentioned something very important. Um, the government played a tremendously important role in this social media censorship. I don't believe they did it on their own. I believe it was actually the result of of direct orders from the federal government in, in the United States, from the U.S. federal government. I, and I know this because I'm, me, Martin, and I are involved in a case brought by Ms., the Missouri Attorney General's office against the Biden administration. Um, this case, we've uh, the judge has permitted us to depose Tony Fauci to uh, to look in to read government emails, communications with Twitter, Facebook. Um, it is a shocking picture, David, of of government officials, including as uh, in, within the the high in, inside the Biden White House, effectively threatening uh, Facebook, all these like social media companies, that if they didn't abide by the censorship demands including lists of people to censor ideas to censor um then they would lose their 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 sort of legal protection against uh against you know uh, uh you know being called a publisher which would then would, would subject wow. to, to, to to legal threat um i mean it's it was basically a government propaganda campaign and the censorship was a tremendously important part of that and and the reason why it was done is because the government policy re- which was so draconian, so out of line with the with previous practice, required that the public think that there was a consensus, a scientific consensus in favor of it, when there actually wasn't. It was an exactly. illusion. The censorship was in service of creating an illusion of consensus that never existed. Well, I, I think so many people would be shocked to hear this. In fact, today, it's hard in many respects that many of the mainstream media don't even talk about this story. The, the, the level of censorship would make George Orwell, the author of 1984, roll in his grave. So in this situation, we have, why is this relevant to Canadians? I think it's directly relevant because so much of our information and news is driven out of social media out of the United States. And also so many of the mainstream um, media in the United States drive so much of the narrative not just in Canada, but frankly, around the world. So this kind of um, high degree of censorship is is really gobsmacking, and it did not allow for a free and open discussion regarding basic facts and evidence that people to this day are struggling to find out about, like even natural immunity. It's it's incredible. I should also point out out that in Canada, some 2,000 media outlets are funded by the federal government, and they have to sign agreements to cover certain issues in in different ways. And and that is incredibly um, undermining in terms of their ability to be journalists and not just simply carrying propaganda for the state. Am I, I mean, this is how I look at this now. And this is, for me, has been a very powerful revelation. Has that been for you as well, uh, Jay and Martin? I think the media has failed, uh, not just in Canada, but uh, certainly in the U.S. and in Western Europe. Uh, uh, so that's for sure. In Canada, there's also been a, an, uh, a campaign against the medical doctors who told the truth about uh, this issue of the pandemic, uh, where they have been uh, threatened to uh, lose the medical license. One example is a very brave physician in uh, 
uh, in Toronto named uh, Kulvinda Kaur. And uh, she's been very brave. She's she has sort of talked about uh, focus protection and uh, tried to uh, 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 disseminate uh, accurate information about COVID and the pandemic. And they went after her medical license. So wow. that should never happen. That's uh, that's a very totalitarian totalitarian uh, regime who does those things. Not exactly. Free society. What about you, Jay? I mean, one thing I, that happened uh, in Canada to to us uh, after we wrote the Great Barrington Declaration, David, uh, the CBC did this very scurrilous uh, roundtable featuring science, some scientists who disagreed with us, uh, but the, but who dis, who essentially uh, mischaracterized our proposal. They they mis they said that we wanted to let the virus rip and we wanted to kill people effectively on on on, on CBC. Um, the, there was a lawyer that we uh, that uh, contacted us that helped us file a complaint to the ombudsman of the CBC, who effectively said it was fair. We didn't didn't deserve a response. Uh, I was never contacted by the CBC to be on there in re to re reply. Martin wasn't, nor neither was Sunetra Gupta. Um, essentially, the Canadian people was fed a propaganda point. The idea that the lockdowns were the only way, that it was the standard science, and that anyone else disagreeing with them was, was dangerous pseudoscientists or fringe epidemiologists, if you will, to coin a term. Um, the, the, um, uh, the, 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 the media essentially propped up the government narrative, even though the government narrative was not rooted in the scientific data. Yeah, no, it, it's truly outrageous what's happened. So I think we, we want to challenge our fellow citizens, no matter where they are in the United States or in Canada, to really take a critical view of the information that's been given them and not fall for, quite frankly, uh, as you say, just mimicking a narrative that was utterly false. So speaking of narrative, one of the, the points of information had to do with the origins of COVID-19. Um, I remember specifically having debates with persons saying that it was all a, quote, conspiracy theory to think that somehow this virus, one of the options that was viable at the time was that it came from a, a lab, laboratory, a class four lab in Wuhan, China, of all places. And that, in fact, it, no, it came from a, um, a wet market uh, from some type of um, uh, bat soup or something like that. But now we have the receipts. We have information, report after report, not just simply from the Department of U.S. Energy, but from the FBI of all places, including the Central Intelligence Agency, where the virus came from. But it's almost like they are reluct reluctant admissions of a fact that has been well established now for quite some time. So is that important information? And what does that tell you, um, Martin? Um, what do, is that significant as another point of information that we know now to be correct in terms of the origins of the virus? Uh, obviously, it's a very important question, uh, uh, both for prevention of future pandemic, but also in terms of the reputation of the scientific community. If there were scientists uh, responsible for this, that uh, doesn't reflect very well on the on scientists. Uh, now, I'm an epidemiologist and a biostatistician, a public health scientist, so I I don't have the expertise to judge the the whether where the virus came from. Uh, and I, I need to sort of focus on those areas that where, where I have some knowledge. So I can't uh, opine on that. But uh, that's also an example where the discussion about it was censored. Uh, it was uh, sweeped under the rug. And that should not, never happen. Exactly. So what do you think, Jay? I mean, I, I think there are scientists on both sides that are debating whether it came from a lab or, or was natural origin. I have to say, in looking at the debate, uh, I, um, what, what, I, what I notice is the same pattern that happened with lockdowns. Uh, the, there, there's, a, there's a central sort of narrative with well-funded go uh, government scientists, funding, uh, funding um, virologists who worked on uh, on ex uh, what I think is probably dangerous experiments to augment the the capacities of viruses like um, the SARS virus, the, the, and um, the, the, they're the ones who are saying that that it's a, it was obviously a natural origin, and for a year almost or longer they 
use the media to make create this idea that if you thought it was a lab leak, it was a conspiracy. You can look at documents from the earliest days of the pandemic where the, the head of the National Institute of Health, Francis Collins, and Tony Fauci are writing to each other. And uh, when the suggestion comes up that it might have been a lab leak, and in fact that the United States government may have they have actually supported the lab that where the leak likely happened, if it happened, then um, they work to cover that idea up. They, they, they use their muscle inside the scientific literature to create this idea that it's, it's established by, beyond all, any reasonable doubt that it was natural origin. They essentially created, again, an illusion of consensus around a scientific point that where there was no, no consensus. Um, it's the same exact dynamic they use with the lockdowns. Uh, they, they use their raw power to, uh, to, to wrangle the scientific community, to wrangle the media, to wrangle even the government itself in, in support of a, a, maybe a false narrative. Now, um, when you reference, Jay, the use of raw power, can you help us understand as lay people how that's done? Um, like we can imagine all kinds of forms of... Um, the use of, of, of lawyer, uh, lawyers are the threat of legal action. We understand that. But what, what do you mean by raw power behind the scenes? It's, it's, it's subtle and yet completely obvious once you see it, right? So uh, I have a position at a, as a professor of medicine in the medical school at Stanford University. In order to get my position, I had to earn NIH grants. It was one of the major hurdles for becoming a tenured professor at a top, top medical school. And, and that's the big funder for scientific research in the United States. Yeah. I mean, now there are some other funders. So, so like I've also gotten support from the Food and Drug Administration for some of my work. I've gotten support from, you know, for, from a, a few other uh, government funders. Um, but the NIH is the big kahuna. I mean, that's how you, that's how you, it's so it's not, but it's not just money so I can do my research. It's also social status within medicine. It's if if I if I have an NIH grant, then I'm invited to review other NIH grants. If I have an if I if I have an NIH grant, it it, it essentially uh, makes it easier for me to get promotions, awards, what, whatnot. So when you have the head of the NIH, and that you have you have the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease, Tom, Francis Collins and Tony Fauci, weigh in on a on incredibly divisive scientific and public health topics on one side and then say that the other side are, are consist of dangerous fringe people with, with obviously false ideas, pseudoscience in effect. Other scientists take note. They don't want their careers destroyed. They don't want to, to face uh, a program. They don't want to be kicked, essentially excommunicated from the scientific community, with like the, which is essentially what the power that someone like Francis Collins and Tony Fauci have. Um, and uh, that kind of, of implicit power, I think, led to a tremendous number of scientists censoring themselves. Mm -hmm. Even Indeed. if they weren't explicitly thinking about NIH grants, they were thinking about the social opprobrium that came from people speaking out against the ideas promoted by Tony Fauci um, and, and, and kept quiet as a result. So it, it, it's really quite ironic that you have senior people in these positions of government authority, frankly, undermining the scientific process in the sense that science should be about seeking truth, should be uh, keeping open-minded uh, about options and analysis, and, and seeking, again, the truth for, for the benefit of society. But instead, they were doing that. They were trying to push a specific narrative. Is that right, uh, Martin? Uh, I think that's right. And um, that's very troublesome. Uh, it goes against the whole principle of science. Uh, and if we don't uh, change that, we will have seen the end of the Age of Enlightenment after about 500 years. Exactly. So uh, I, uh, I, blame, uh, I blame the scientific leaders a lot because uh, I don't blame regular citizens because they were fed one thing. So it's not strange that they believed that lockdowns would work, that there were consensus, even though there wasn't. So I don't blame regular citizens for, for what happened. I do blame a leading scientists who who uh, uh, shut down the debates and who pushed their uh, narrative. And it's very strange because Francis Collins and uh, Anthony Fauci in, US, in the U.S. they are both uh, lab scientists. They don't know much about public health, 
but they were the one who was leading the public health response, uh, even though they don't know much about it. Uh, it I also blame uh, journalists because it's the job of journalists to actually do inquire and try to find uh, different viewpoints and uh, expose them and uh, critically evaluate them. And of course, it's also responsibility of politicians to listen to everybody and then to uh, 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 see what makes more sense. Like uh, during the Second World War, uh, uh, Churchill is famous for he had his generals there arguing with each other. What was the best approach? And that's what... That's what uh, uh, Trump and Biden and Trudeau should have been doing. They should have gotten in people with different views, different public health science with different views, and then hear them out and have them argue with each other. So that would be a key recommendation, Martin, is that we need open, vigorous debate, uh, not just simply in the halls of parliament, but also among scientists. And that needs to be uh, very open. And, and uh, frankly, that's a gift to society. Is that right? Yes, and also among the public. Indeed. So, you know, it's almost like there's a perfect storm here. We have institution after institution that didn't seem to be doing their job, asking, as you say, what those critical questions were, um, you know, having that kind of uh, fulsome debate uh, in a respectful way, but that would actually, um, frankly, it, it seemed like so many people weren't doing their job. It wasn't just, you know, universities or public health officials or politicians. Uh, people seem to be afraid. So how did this just happen overnight, Jay? I, I mean, I think uh, the the key element, if I had to pick one, is fear. Um, and the you know, like it's we're we're as humans built to fear infectious diseases. I mean, it's like built into our 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 like lizard brain almost because we're we're just you know it's uh, like for, for the from the earliest times we uh, infectious diseases have. have Played a huge role in in the uh, in, in in deaths in deaths in in risks that we face from being in community with each other, um, and so you have a powerful psychological built-in force in 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 the entire human population. Civilizations are created essentially to temper that 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 and to counter it that fear. Um, we 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 engage in, in community with each other because it's good for us, even though there may be infectious disease risks from doing so. We're meant to be, we're not meant to be alone. Um, now, what happened during the pandemic was that governments used that built-in psychological aversion, this fear of, of pathogens, to gain, to, 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 and, 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 and then amplified it, right? The messaging from the from government after government was that COVID was a unique threat mm -hmm. to every single person equally, right? There was a there was an ad I remember, remember from Australia of a, a young attractive woman in an ICU, uh, essentially like with with tremendously labored breathing, clearly dying, and it was you know stay home, stay safe, right? It was the 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 the, the governments use this fear. Public health used this fear, you know, and and why did they do it? Part, I mean, what they what they will say is that they used it because they wanted everyone to take the virus seriously. But in fact, what the per, the end end goal, the end the end point was essentially compliance with the orders that the public health was giving. I, th I think that that's if I had to peg the cardinal sin of public health, because I mean, it, from my view, um, I had thought that public health had uh, said. Had, had eschewed those kinds of te techniques that you would never ever engage in fear mongering, in creating divisions between people to, to essentially to label other others as unclean. Never I've seen this before. Uh, I've never seen it before. Have you? Well, I mean, I think you know you could point to the early days of HIV, maybe uh, where, where there was some st there, there was stigmatization of, of people. I mean, there was a lot of stigmatization of people in the population. Uh, public health actually played some role in that, but like worked to finally work to counter it. Um, uh, but I think in here, you, public health played a tremendously destructive role. Like we we sp public health spread the idea that other humans were were biohazards, and we need to av to avoid the biohazard if we wanted to live. That is a tremendous, for civilizations, it's tremendously destructive to have that idea at large. So, Martin, if we looked at this situation, how do we prevent this from ever happening again? Are there 
basic advice and recommendations that you would have so that we do not experience this again as a as a as a Canadian society and data world? I think it's important that the public at large realizes and understands that this was the biggest public health fiasco in history. I don't trust that the politicians or the public health uh, officials or the media is not going to do the same mistake again. Uh, what did change things uh, eventually during this pandemic was the public, the truckers in Canada, but not just the truckers, many others as well. Uh, that's what uh, sh- uh, changed uh, the whole narrative. and. Uh, so I think that's what we have to rely on the public to uh, where there is sanity, where there is common wow. sense and who actually understands that the national immunity exists. If you've had measles, you don't get measles again. If you've had COVID, uh, you might get it again, but it won't be uh, uh, in a serious manner. And we have known that for two and a half thousand years and the public still knows it, but the public health establishment forgot about it for three years and they are sort of now slowly waking up from uh, their dream of ignorance. Wow, well said, Martin. And it's fascinating you said something very interesting. And I I don't know if our, our, our viewers would know this, but you are originally from Sweden. You live in the United States. You're a prominent health official. And you said something very interesting. You said that the the truckers convoy in Canada made a difference. It was impossible to ignore. And they were scientifically correct, while the public health officials were not. They were following the science. Yes, they are not only following the roads, they're also following the science. So this is quite an irony, as our prime minister emphasized this time and time again, we're trying to follow the science, even though they introduced a mandate on a population, namely independent truckers who did not move about. They were isolated in their cabs. Generally, most of the time, there wasn't any scientific evidence that we're still not aware of that would justify such a uh, divisive type of mandate that would threaten their their livelihoods. So this is quite interesting. The trackers are both smart, but also very well educated. And I can imagine why, because they sit there in the tracks all day and they listen to podcasts or other things. Uh, So I think they are very well informed about what's going on in the world. Wow, what a great insight. How would you respond to, uh, what advice would you have for us, Jay, as we work to try to get on a path of healing and not and prevent this from happening again. I mean, David, every institution failed. I I was involved with a couple of of major court cases in Canada. um, And it was frankly shocking to see uh, how difficult it was for even high justices to to look at the uh, scientific evidence squarely when even when it contradicted government policy and, gov- and government scientists even when the scient- the government scientists were just wrong on the facts um you know uh, you 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 um you have uh and, and now you wouldn't normally think of courts as a place where uh where like basic fundamental rights would be protected right so basic civil rights basic right to travel within the, within one's own country would be protected um, the right to, to to hold religious ceremonies that are important for for your for your life, um, the the right to to speak, and yet courts in Canada fail to do that over and over and over again. Um, the 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 Canadian this I just should, shouldn't just say Canada that happened in the United States happened all over the world. Um, the 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 uh, the uh, uh, the media failed. Right, they didn't ask basic questions. The scientists and public health authorities failed. The government failed to, to respect the, the the basic rights. Yeah, you know, take the truckers. The leaders of that trucker movement had their bank accounts seized for the crime of holding a protest. How is that consist, consistent with living in a free society? Um, I, I think Canada has a tough road ahead, David, and I don't know how to repair all of it i don't think anybody does but i do think that we have to keep speaking out um and hold fast to the the scientific truths the the truths we have about 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 um about civil liberties the truths we know about uh, pandemic management uh and public health all of that we have to keep saying over and over again until there is reform so that we can get back to uh, our, our, our our great civilization 
Um, we can't let the enlightenment end. I mean, that's essentially what I mean, Martin says that it, just, it sends chills up and down my spine. The, the enlightenment is, is, is the basis for, um, for so much of our civilization. And if we are now in an, a, in an age where essentially we can let biological risks trans, uh, overturn every single com commitment we have to each other, um, I think it's a very, very dangerous time. Well said, Dr. J. Bhattacharya and Dr. Martin Koldorf. Thank you so much for being with us today in this far-reaching conversation about lessons learned from COVID-19. We thank you so much for your courage and your commitment to the truth. And as we work, walk on this journey together, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having thank us. You. So that brings to a close our discussion today about COVID-19. We're so glad that you could join us and be sure to continue to keep in touch with The Frontier. Please uh, subscribe to our newsletter and check out our website at www.fcpp.org for more information. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.